On today's episode, Liz and I talk with Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife about healthy sexuality and why many struggle in this area. She also discusses how to develop the capacity for deeper emotional and sexual intimacy, and she shares the number one goal she has for people who visit with her and her practice. Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife is a relationship and sexuality coach with a PhD in counseling psychology. Her teaching and coaching focus on helping individuals and couples achieve greater satisfaction and passion in their emotional and sexual relationships. In addition to her private practice, Dr. Finlayson Fife has created five empowering online courses. Each course was designed to give LDS individuals and couples the tools needed to create healthier lives and stronger intimate relationships. Dr. Finlayson Fife also offers many workshops and retreats where she teaches these life-changing principles in person. Dr. Finlayson Fife is a frequent guest on podcasts on the subjects of sexuality, relationships, mental health, and faith. She's also the creator and host of Room for Two, a popular sex and intimacy coaching podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Stronger Marriage Connection. I'm Dr. Liz Hale, clinical psychologist, along with my friend, the esteemed professor, Dr. Dave Schramm. Together, we are dedicating our life's work to bringing you the best we have in valid marital research, along with a few tips and tools to help you create the marriage of your dreams. We have a very special guest today. She, I tell you, she's a rock star. Can I just tell you that? She is the go-to sex therapist. And while she's indeed an incredible therapist who deals primarily with relational and sexual issues, Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife says her therapy focuses mainly on the challenges of being human. Dr. Finlayson Fife, welcome to Stronger Marriage Connection. Thank you for having me. Such a such a treat. Wow, we are honored. As a marriage and family therapist in private practice in, here in Salt Lake City, your name is the one name my clients favorably mention most often, other than any other good professional in the field, and there are many of them. You are well thought of and admired in this community, and I'm sure in other communities, no matter where you're taping, <laughs> right? Because that could be from anywhere, but especially in your very own community of Chicago, Illinois. Mm. Yeah, this is really is. We're, we're so looking forward to the, our discussion, uh, Dr. Finlayson Fife, on uh, the topic of sexuality and how it influences our relationships and how it influences a stronger marriage connection. So I'm, I'm just going to jump right in because I think almost all couples are going to deal with if they haven't, they will be dealing with sexual issue issues some at some point in their in their relationship. I actually did some research um, when I was a graduate student here at Utah State University. I surveyed over a thousand newlywed couples here in Utah and discovered, not surprisingly, that in the top three issues, it, I think it was time and sex and money. And those in the newlywed years, and then even after that, we're finding that this issue continues to, to come up. So since sexual problems, they affect how people feel about themselves, uh, how they feel about each other, and relationship happiness is often at stake with all of this. So where do you begin in your sexuality coaching with clients? And what are some of the areas we could all benefit from better understanding? Mm. Well, I think as humans, we are often inclined to think of sexuality as kind of a separate issue than how we relate to one another and how we relate to ourselves or how we relate to faith. And I think they're very, very connected. So when I start working with a couple, I am interested in how they relate to each other, which is to say, how do they handle anxieties, disagreements, um, how much they reveal themselves to each other, because it shows me a lot about where this couple has strengths and where it has its liabilities. And what I mean by that is, being intimate is much, much harder than we often realize. We often say, well, yes, I, I love intimacy. I want to be intimate with my spouse. But what we often mean is I want to share things about myself and find acceptance and welcome there. But that's different than being willing to be intimate, which is being willing to be knowable, underdeveloped parts and all. You know, So we are often afraid of being knowable to our spouse even though we want, we take great relief in it at the same time. And so 
in sexuality where many people have anxieties, often more than they have in other domains of their life, we're very good at looking for approval in our partner, but having a difficult time being able to be at peace with ourselves and let ourselves be known and to share ourselves in the sexual realm. And so this struggle often shows up very quickly in marriage. And it also shows up in other domains in which couples operate. So my work is to help people start to see themselves more accurately, because as human beings, we're very good at telling ourselves stories that justify what we do. You know, I, I, my, I do this because my spouse does that, or, you know, I'm just trying to be righteous. That's why I don't do that. But, but they often are stories that keep us stuck and keep us from the truth that will set us free. Beautiful. You know, it's hard to even be knowable to self sometimes, Jennifer, don't you think? Let alone knowable to my partner. Yes. Ugh, there's things I just don't want to look at. A hundred percent. We're I mean, I often talk about marriage as a divine institution because it exposes us to ourselves. And so, you know, like my son who has autism said once, You need you need to get married because you need someone to tell you if you have ticks or moles on your back. <laughs> and metaphorically <laughs> Oh, <laughs> right on point. Is... You know, we we need somebody who points out those things we cannot see, and you know, a lot of times we shoot the messenger rather than deal with what's in fact true and what they're saying. But we do much better when we deal with the parts of ourselves that we haven't yet accounted for because they push us to be better. Your son is brilliant. I love that. I'm never going to forget that. The, the primary focus of your study and professional work is indeed on healthy sexuality, including your dissertation, which is the focus of LDS women and sexual agency. What were the top insights you discovered in your studies and in your dissertation? Well, the first is that a lot of women, even though we have a single standard of sexual behavior in the law of chastity, there was a lot of women who still interpreted it through a sexist lens, meaning they had help with that. They didn't just make it up a lot of, you know, don't be the licked cupcake, you know, make sure you're pure for your future husband. There was a lot of cultural ideas that had made them feel that sexuality was less okay for them than it was for a man. Sexual indiscretion was like, you know, really, really bad for a female, but not as bad for a man. And so those kinds of things really interfered with their ability to, because I was looking at women who had grown up in the church, were active in the church and married, and looking primarily at that transition into marriage, did women feel like they could create the kind of sexual relationship that they desired? And most women struggled because of a lot of these cultural inheritances that were not even theological, but still had been framed as theological. But the other takeaway was that there was a small percentage of women who had really seen the law of chastity, for example, and the expectation that men, you know, bring their sexuality for the good of family life and so on, that they really saw those things as underscoring their agency. That is to say, it was creating the reality that they really desired. And so these were women that valued their their point of view, saw themselves as equals with their spouses, operated as equals in the choices that they made as a couple and in the sexual realm. So there were a percentage of women who did not buy into that sexism and were able to really claim um, principles in the church that facilitated the reality that they desired in their lives. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's interesting. I agree. That's interesting. Kind of hear the foundation and then how things have continued to hopefully um, improve the more that you, we could all um, share and, and make that known. You teach yeah. um, some online very popular online classes and, and hold live workshops and you're teaching individuals and couples how to develop their capacity for deeper emotional mm -hmm. and sexual intimacy. What's the number one goal you have for your participants and for really each one of us when it comes to developing a healthy sexuality in marriage? That's a good question. I mean, I think the number one goal is increasing people's ability to have joy in their lives. And, you know, you can't, Joy is not just something, you know, happiness or good luck. Those are things that just kind of happen to you in a way. Uh, they're more based on circumstance or good fortune. 
But joy is more the ability to see beauty and to embrace and take in beauty. And it's, de it's dependent upon our moral, spiritual, relational, and self-development. And so I believe the mechanism to help foster our development is seeing truthfully, seeing ourselves truthfully, seeing our partnership truthfully. It helps us wake up and change things because we can't change what we cannot see. So as we become more aligned with what is truthful, the more we develop in our capacity to love, to choose, to receive love, to receive care, we grow in our ability to know our value, but not to think of ourselves as better than nor less than. And this facilitates true intimacy, true joy, true beauty, the ability to have sexuality be a real source of peace and sustenance. So, you know, the, it, it's not um, that there's just people that arrive and people that don't arrive. Every step you take frees up your life. Every step you take along that path helps you be more at peace with yourself and more capable of love in your relationships, whether that's marriage, with children, with friends. So it's just facilitating through truthful principles people's ability to grow into deeper freedom in their lives. Oh, that's beautiful. I love about joy. I had not thought of it that way. That makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. You know, to be known is really so difficult. A lot of couples I sit down with will say, well, everybody at work loves me. My family loves me. My, you know, my children love me. Everybody loves me, but her, <laughs> right? This person, that's where the rubber meets the road. No, nothing really matters. No other relationship matters like the one right in front of me. I love that you say intimacy is never easy. It wasn't meant to be easy. But how can each one of us increase our capacity for intimacy so that we're more willing to know and be known by our spouse? Is there a, a magic bullet there? Yeah, I think it's at least not seeing the marital struggles as a problem, but rather as a process or a mechanism to grow you up. So if we see it as, oh, I married the wrong person, or what is your problem that you're not happy with me like my coworker's happy with me, but instead to see what is there to be understood about myself, about this marriage, about my spouse, and use it as a way to step into the discomfort of what is true, that will help us grow. And so if we can understand it as that, it helps us to not just be in kind of meaningless suffering to choose a more meaningful suffering. I mean, I know that sounds like masochistic, mm -hmm. but I mean yeah. to actually step towards the challenge because it will make us stronger when we do that. Yeah. The purpose of it, right? There's a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. yeah. We greatly, uh, I, I think we can say this on behalf of Liz, we, we greatly respect that your differentiation um, based approach and helping individual partners see their own role in what at times can be a, uh, a frustrating dynamic in marriage. Do you mind giving us an example of how you've helped uh, two partners in a marriage understand their own self-defeating and, and destructive patterns? Sure. Um, I do a podcast called Room for Two, so I work a lot on these issues with couples. They're anonymous couples, and I'm giving them feedback. One of the most recent couples I worked with is a kind of perfect case in point, which is that, you know, he would confuse, do you love me with I love you? So he was often kind of trying to, you know, pressure, push, punish his wife into being more available to him emotionally and sexually, which of course would make her, so he was dependent on her to manage his sense of self. That's a limited amount of differentiation. She, on the other hand, couldn't tolerate displeasing without making it feel, making herself feel very bad. So to make her husband be unhappy with her would make her so anxious that she would comply in order to manage her own limited sense of self. So it was like a perfect storm. You know, he would pursue, she would comply, but neither one of them felt any peace because they would go away from those interactions feeling kind of resentful. He would not feel desired. So he would see his wife who would be willing to sit on the couch with him and watch a movie or willing to be sexual, but it never felt like it was coming from something authentic or it seldom insufficiently felt like it was coming from something authentic and genuine in her, although he was complicit in that reality. 
And her inability to say no made it so she wasn't really able to say yes. Like her need to have him be okay with her interfered with her just choosing to love him. So I was helping them to wake up to their part in this recurring painful pattern and to reveal, help them see that this is not about love. This is about kind of finding a self in the other person, but in a way that keeps them dependent and trapped. And so then their work is in seeing this and not engaging it. So for him, when he's feeling anxious, not going and doing the things that give her the signals that he wants her to come towards him, but instead going on a walk, regulating himself, praying if that's helpful, you know, finding a way to stabilize himself so he doesn't use his wife to reassure himself, but can actually choose her and value her and give her her own space to be her own self and have the room to choose him without always having to manage his ego. So that's a version of how couples grow. Let me think of another one. There's another one that comes to mind um, where she, she, you know, she would be very controlling in the marriage because she was so afraid of being disappointed. She'd grown up with a disappointing father. And so she married a man who could be kind of spineless sometimes and would push him because she wanted to not really trust a man. She didn't want to really let him make his own choices for fear of being disappointed. Of course, what that would do, though, is create a basically disappointment (laughs) because he would comply, but then he would also resist and he would feel frustrated and controlled and then would sometimes escape into his own world. Sometimes that included porn, you know, so there's just like trying to get away from her. And so, again, it's like helping them see this pattern in a similar way and what they can each what they each have to confront for her it was realizing i keep going into this one up controlling judgmental position to manage my fears he's realizing i you know i actually act like a child in many ways and then want to resent that she doesn't treat me like a man and for him to recognize he has to step more into what is truthful and be more honest and tolerate her displeasure at times but allow that honesty to reveal themselves to one another and to themselves, right? We're, we, we claim to love the truth, but yeah. most of us don't really like it. Oh, <laughs> well said. Yeah. We'll be right back after this brief message. And we're back. Well, let's dive right in. Can I follow that up, um, Jennifer, with, because now it's starting to kind of click, you know, that there's these patterns that each couple is going to, I mean, the two that you just shared are different patterns. I think, and I don't know if it's about you or even Liz, but the question I get so often, at least from, from males, will say, I'm high desire. You know, my wife is, is low desire. I know that's not always the case, but th- this is what I hear often you know, what can I do? You know, how can I, can I help? And then from the woman's perspective, you know, what do I do in this? Do I just comply? But if if, if there's not like a one size fits all easy solution because of some of the patterns, the the struggles, the backgrounds, the mental health and and things that are going on, what do you suggest to couples that say, I'm the high desire and they're the low desire? Well, there's nothing strange about there being differences in couples around lots of things, sex being one of them, just like native comfort with sensuality, for example, or native interest in sexuality. There may be just differences. And part of any good partnership is finding a way to build a bridge across those differences and to make room for two people to be happy in a marriage. Those are the happiest marriages. It's like, how do we take who we each are the best in who we each are and create something where we can both be happy enough. Right. The, the problem is, is that because sexuality gets so readily linked to our sense of self that our immaturities quickly start to infect native differences and make them more punctuated. Right. So the woman who feels like she can't say no, for example, like she, she actually was a woman who liked sex. Like she had a real interest in it premaritally, but because it was so connected to managing his ego, 
her desire just went way, way down because she didn't want to have to manage his feelings all the time. So one of the things you want to look at is, you know, am I trying to earn a self through my sexual desire or my lack of it? Right. Because she was trying to hold a boundary by having no desire. He's trying to get the reassurance that he's loved through desire. It's a false version of desire. That's more about neediness. So this might not be the quick answer, David, that you're maybe no, looking for, but it's good. helping people help. Yeah. Helping people to tease out where their sense of self is interfering with a dynamic because it, it, it might be much more different in its appearance than it actually is. Because as I work with couples and they start to get better able to regulate themselves, like for example, the couple where she was always building a wall. Well, when she sees her husband actually taking himself on and handling himself and, you know, giving her space, well, not only does she have more space and isn't being trying to manage him, but she actually feels more respect and like recognizes he loves her and he's really trying to handle himself. And that's very desirable. Yes. So it, it actually can shift a dynamic relatively quickly if people really do deal with who they are. That is beautiful. It does become so much more attractive. That's kind of the almost the paradox, isn't it, Jennifer? It is. I mean, women, love, women love men who take themselves on. <laughs> women love men really who do. are men. Yes. Yeah. And and I'll say too, men love women who are women. Absolutely. Right. We love strength in people. We really do. I mean, we're drawn to it because it's trustworthy. Now, sometimes we're afraid of it because we want our spouse in our back pocket. We want them in some ways to be self-doubting because it allows us to coddle our own self-doubts. So I don't mean that we necessarily facilitate it in our partner, but when we see it, it does demand a kind of respect from us because it takes courage. Yeah. Yes. That's great. Now we know why you are the rock star. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to sexuality. So really, it is, it's about growing up, isn't it? I've always said that I felt like marriage was the, the ultimate self-improvement process. Yeah. It is a chance for us to grow up. One of the largest developments, um, hurdles I think clients face, many of us face, is this perfectionism. And you say perfectionism is a self-contempt effort. Wow, that's big. How do you save women? How do you save me from myself <laughs> by helping me ditch this perfectionism? And what is really going on behind my flawed thinking um, of this veil yeah. of perfectionism, please? Well, I would say, you know, generally speaking, perfectionism is this terror that our humanity will expose us as unlovable, which is different than an effort towards like development or even mastery of something like we we can want to really become good at something because we love it so much because we value it so it isn't sometimes people think i'm saying we should just sit on the couch and you know watch tv if we're not perfectionistic and that's not what i mean by perfectionism what i mean is i am trying to earn a self by demonstrating my flawlessness that i'm somehow above the human condition and so we have this fear that our humanity makes us unlovable or unworthy. And when we're young in our development, that's a pretty normal thing. We're looking to others to tell us we're enough. We're looking to prove ourselves to the minds of others. And we don't really have another way to begin the developmental process. But if we can come to know that we have implicit value, that we're loved by a God in heaven, that our value is immutable, right? We have this ability to stop trying to prove to others' minds that we are not flawed, actually embrace that we're flawed, and continue to grow and become more godly, to become better, to be able to do more good in the world. It's, it sounds maybe like I'm saying the same thing, but it's not a flawless model. It's an integrity model. When Christ said, be ye therefore perfect, this was pre-industrial revolution. And so perfect meant complete at that time. It meant being whole, having integrity of the entity, where in the post-industrial revolution, it became flawless because this was machine manufactured idea. So flawless is not the goal. And sometimes we talk about atonement and all those things from a flawless idea, which is not theological, in my opinion, rather a developmental and growth idea is really more on point. 
Well, my flaws are obvious. So maybe I am not as perfectionistic as I thought. You know, I, I would love to also ask you, Jennifer, about this other this other syndrome, the, the superwoman complex. And yeah. is that different or similar to perfectionism? It's very similar. I mean, it's very okay. similar. I, how it might be different is sometimes perfectionism is more like, I have to just prove I'm not a horrifyingly bad human. Like, so that's more the one down trying to just feel acceptable. Superwoman is kind of like, I'm above you know, I'm up here. All of this is flawless. My Instagram feed is only giving the most perfect affected images of, you know, be doing everything that the culture idealizes in the right way. So it's more that we're trying to put ourselves above perhaps, but it is the same idea. We're trying to earn a self in the eyes of others. Wow. Okay. I get it. I get it. I get that. Mm -hmm. Can we um, turn to stress a little bit and and it feels like societies, there's so much stress and struggle and worry and anxiety today. And we know, you know, stress is inevitable. We're all going to experience it. And yet it can really take a toll on our relationships. What do you teach couples to, to do to calm their own reactivity and best handle mm -hmm. relationship stress in ways that, that, you know, preserve intimacy and openness in their mm -hmm. relationship? Well, one thing is just to recognize it because what happens sometimes if, if our spouse says something that hits a nerve or that we, you know, don't like, we can just go limbic like that and be speaking out of our most reactive self and doing destruction usually, right? We're usually, I, I teach in my classes about these kind of losing strategies as a Terry real idea, but like we do these things that are feel good in the moment that speak to our regressive brain. <laughs> and so just to recognize that we like those things, that we go to them easily, helps us to not indulge in that direction. And when we don't indulge, it pushes our brain to be able to sort out an answer at a higher level. Okay, but so the first is recognizing it. And then if you know that even in recognizing it, you can't, you, you're not able to stop yourself because you're just too overwhelmed, too regressed, too upset, it's to extract yourself from the situation until you can calm down. So to say, like, I'm not going to be able to have this conversation productively. I'm going to go on a walk. I'm, I'll come back. Let's try it again in 30 minutes. I just need to get my head on straight. So, so it's just recognizing it and doing what you need be, so that you can. I mean, a lot of times we're trying to solve nuanced problems from our most regressed place, and, and it just doesn't go together. The other thing I would say is while you're on that walk, <laughs> be asking the question, how am I a part of this problem, right? What am I pretending not to know about my role in my spouse's position, reactivity, whatever? Because again, we we like the idea that it's all our partner's fault because it, you know, it kind of releases us from responsibility. But on the other hand, to recognize you have a role and you're even a part of their reactivity frees you up to actually solve things better and to do things differently. So this is just the last thing I'll say is when we think it's all in someone else's hands, our reactivity goes up because we feel powerless. If we can get it back into what, what can I control here? What is my job in this? It calms us down. It sobers us up, but it also puts us back into like, okay, what is my role in addressing this in a constructive way? And so it does calm us down to feel like we're in the driver's seat of our own choices. Wow. What am I pretending not to know? Oh, it's brilliant. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, you mentioned how Dr. David Schnarch shares this idea that none of us chooses whether or not we're going to experience anxiety. We only get to choose whether that anxiety is going to be productive or unproductive, a bit like stress. And you asked this particular question, do you want to take your anxiety up front or do you want to live in it? Please share more about this. It's this overarching theme in your yeah. work with clients, it seems. Yeah. Well, it just seems so much easier to not take it up front. And we kind of delude ourselves that if we don't address the difficult thing in our marriage or with our child or, or in our lives, that it will go away or we don't have to deal with it. But instead, it goes underground and it just wreaks havoc in a space where it's harder to kind of identify or deal with. The problem with going towards difficult things straight up and why we aren't so good at it as human beings is because it disorganizes our minds to do it. You know, it's like if you think about exercising, everybody wants to be strong, but it's so hard to go to the gym. <laughs> you know, we want to be fit, 
But like to go to the gym and actually lift those weights and actually go through an exercise class or not eat the thing, you know, you don't want to keep eating. That means taking the discomfort straight up. And so because that means it pushes us into a growth process and that is uncomfortable, we resist it easily. But it doesn't mean it goes away. We just pay the price of being unhealthy, right? Or we pay the price of not dealing with a relational issue. So it's just reminding clients, you don't actually get away from these struggles. You just decide whether or not you're going to get stronger and sort of build the capacity to deal with the difficulty or let the difficulty run your life. You're always going to be running from it, running scared. And so just the more you can hand people the choice, the more they're like, okay, well, it would be dumb to not deal with it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it helps them see more That's of what they're so doing. well said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I get it. Thank mm-hmm. you for that. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, we like to, to ask all of our guests and what they, they feel like the, the key is to a stronger marriage connection. What's your response to that? Well, if I were to say the number one key, because there's a lot of pieces in it, is the willingness to, to face more truth through the, the, the looking glass of the marriage. And to utilize it to say, where is my spouse right about me? Okay, what are they? They may be getting D, E, and F wrong, but maybe I need to go in and deal with A, B, and C. (laughs) You know, and the more you do that, the stronger the marriage will get. And at a minimum, the more you will respect yourself because you know you're living honestly, you know you're living faithfully to that marital promise, even if your spouse doesn't. so I, I would say that's the number one thing. And I've said it to my kids too. Like if you, if there's only one quality in the person you marry and in what you do is that you will marry someone who is willing to look at herself or himself, that they're willing to be honest about their flaws and all, and that you do the same because that's like the number one way of knowing that it's a marriage that will grow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So powerful here on the stronger marriage connection. We've talked about, searching inward and how that's really the first step. So that really resonates with us here. Um, now, where can people go? I know listeners um, are listening and say, man, I want to know more information. Can you tell us where people can go for the online courses, the, the books, the information, more about you? Sure. Um, the best place is my website, which is my last name, finlayson-fife.com. And you can find the five online courses that I teach. They're all asynchronous live workshops that we do. The podcast, Room for Two, where you can listen to me working with couples on intimacy, uh, sexual and emotional intimacy challenges. So um, it's all there, including just free podcasts like this, where people can just listen to me talk about different topics. So, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And we'll put all those in the show notes for our listeners um, as well. So as we wrap up our, our time together, we like to... Um, share just our takeaway of the day. If there's, if there's one message and you may have discussed it already, Mm. but if there's one Mm. message that you hope our listeners will, will take away from our discussion or that you really want to get across, what would that be? Well, I think this is an idea my husband and I were just talking about, and it's a sort of a similar idea, but Carl Jung, um, kind of Freudian contemporary said something like, you know, all unnecessary suffering is a part of avoiding necessary suffering. And so just remember that suffering is a part of life, but we can decide if we step into purposeful discomfort, purposeful suffering to become stronger, to become better people, to become more capable of love. And in the chaos that we can feel in our lives, the uncertainty, the anxiety, the spouse that's disappointing us, you know, there's still a deep order in our lives. And as we push for what is true, we find that order. So it does push us. It is uncomfortable, but to trust in the truth, the the trust in honesty with yourself, trust in honesty in your marriage, because it will show you what you need to know to get stronger. Yeah, that's great. I love it. Thank you. Liz, what about you? What's your takeaway? Isn't that something, that needless emotional turmoil, I like to say? Ah, 
Brilliant, Jennifer. You know, I have copious notes here. I needed a bigger notepad. (laughs) It was way too small. But something about what you said, especially to women, if I can't say no, then I'm not free to say yes. Oh, I just thought that was brilliant. That is my takeaway. Dave, what is your takeaway today from our time with Jennifer? Yeah, this has been uh, giving me a lot to think about, really. I think one of the things that uh, stood out to me is just this awareness. It's almost kind of taking a step out of this pattern because we get into these, you know, relationship rituals and and relationship ruts and these these habits that we get into and this pursue withdrawal or I'm not going to say anything. Being able to take a step back and say, um, you know, what what is this pattern and what role do I have in this? You know, how am I feeding this this loop? Kind of an in that, yeah. I don't know. That's that's kind of insightful for for me today. So I appreciate that. Well, Doctor Finlayson Five, we sure appreciate your your time, for your wisdom, for the many resources that you have uh, have given. You've helped so many couples and continue to do so. We appreciate you coming on uh, the Stronger Marriage Connection podcast with us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, keep taking the world by storm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We hope you do that. And that's all now, uh, friends, for us here at the Stronger Marriage Connection. We hope to see you next time. And do remember, it's the small and simple things that make a stronger marriage connection. Take care now. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a few minutes to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel, where you can watch this and every episode of the show. When you hit the like button and leave a comment, your feedback helps us improve the show. And don't forget to share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and connect with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and on Facebook at Stronger Marriage. Be sure to share with us what topics you want us to explore or what you loved about today's episode. If you want even more resources to improve your relationship connection, visit our website at StrongerMarriage.org where you'll find free workshops, webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted and sponsored by the Utah Marriage Commission at Utah State University. And finally, a big thanks to our producers Rex Polanis and Alexis Alcott and the team at Utah State University. And you, our audience, you make this show possible.